What is life? I mean, what is the fundamental difference between you and, well, everyone buried here? Is life quantifiable? Is it definable? And if you could find an acceptable definition for yourself, would it be a real definition? One that the experts could agree on? Well, you might say, I'm no expert, but the difference is obvious. I'm moving around and breathing and eating and stuff like that, and these people just aren't doing that anymore. Now, that may not sound like a very scientific answer, but the truth is, scientists and experts have never really come up with any definition of life that's any clearer than that. Biology is the combination of two words, bios, meaning life, and logos, meaning word or study. So biology is the study of life. And if somebody should be able to give us a good definition of life, it's these guys, the dictionary writers. Life, something essential to the continued existence of something else. Life, that property of plants and animals which makes it possible for them to take in food, get energy, and reproduce. Life, that quality that distinguishes a living organism from a dead organism. The dictionary defines life as that property, or that distinguishing quality. In other words, life is that indescribable, indistinguishable, essential something. What about a modern biology textbook? These are the people that actually have biology as a career. What do they say about defining life? Let's see. Biologists have determined that life is difficult to define, but they have determined that it is associated with various properties. Living things take in energy, use that energy to do work, they respond to the outside environment, and they develop and reproduce. Well, even the biologists must content themselves with merely pointing out what living things do, because life, it seems, is difficult to define. Science may not be great at defining what life is, but it excels at taking it apart, analyzing it, and classifying it for future research. People are compelled to classify and organize things. Granted, some of us are better at it than others, but organization helps us see what we've got to get what we need just to get through the day. Look here. Shirts, pants, sweaters, jackets, t-shirts, socks, white socks here, colored socks here, wife's stuff here, husband's stuff here. Look at this. Talk about classification. Nuts, bolts, screws, special length of bolts, widgets, everything you need to fix something. All because someone categorized it and organized it. There's even a special name for this business of classifying stuff. Taxonomy. It comes from two Greek words, taxis meaning to arrange or classify, and nomos meaning the laws. Taxonomy then is the law of classifying things. Imagine that this restaurant table is the land, earth, and all the things on it are all the creatures. You got your pepper creature here and your fork creature here and you know. How many different ways could you classify all the things at just this table? For starters, we could classify according to what they're made of. Glass things over here, metal things over here, and uh, paper things over here. That's one way of doing taxonomy, of classifying things. Or we could classify according to what they're made to do. Liquid holders would be here, solid food holders there, uh, pointy and sharp things over here, spoons, and a napkin by itself. Each of these is a legitimate, even scientific way of categorizing dinner table items, of doing taxonomy. Today, that's the most popular method of doing taxonomy, classification according to physical structure, which of course would bring us here, to a church.
because it was a Christian, a clergyman and a biologist named John Ray who started us on this currently popular system of classification. And it's a good system too. Ray wrote a biology book and he titled it, The Wisdom of God Manifested in the Works of the Creation. Ray recognized how similar structures were evidence of a common, brilliant designer, God. That's why he titled his book, The Wisdom of God Manifested in the Works of the Creation. Years later, this book found its way into the hands of another Christian named Carolus Linnaeus. Linnaeus expanded Ray's ideas and, being a compulsive classifier himself, he came up with a simple, practical method of taxonomy. The idea really caught on, and Linnaeus' basic method is still used by scientists today. Linnaeus split the natural world into two very obvious categories, plants and animals, technically called plantae and animalia. Here are Linnaeus' categories, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Half of these are familiar everyday words, kingdom, class, family, and order, but three of them are less familiar. Phylum is Greek for tribe. Genus is related to our word gender and means a type of something. And species is related to the word special. It means a special kind of something. The plant kingdom uses division in place of the word phylum. The categories continue to narrow until we arrive at just one particular plant or animal. Let's take a look at how this system works with a fairly well-known creature. All animals are grouped together in the Animalia Kingdom. Animal means living being and is related to our word animate because they move. It basically includes everything from squids to spiders and elephants, nearly every creature except plants and people. Next, only a small percentage of all these animals have a spine, and we'll put these into a phylum called chordata, which roughly translates as with a spine. Next, only about 9,000 kinds of these chordates can actually fly. We'll put these in a class called birds, or avis, which is where we get the word aviary. Next, about 6,000 kinds of all birds can actually perch on limbs. They go into an order called passeriformes, meaning birds that perch. Then, there's a few hundred of all perching birds that also catch insects on the fly. These go into a family called musicapidae, meaning true flycatchers. Next, of all these fly-catching perching birds, about 70 kinds are known for a characteristically brown plumage and spotted breast. These go into the thrush family, or in Latin, turtus. And finally, of all the thrushes, one and only one of them is categorized for its migratory habit, the species migratorius, the turtus migratorius, better known as the American Robin. That's how classification by physical structure works. The first book of the Bible, Genesis, also does taxonomy. It classifies life according to the days of creation. On day three, all the vegetation was created. Trees, plants, flowers, grass. On day five, flying creatures and water creatures. And on day six, all the land animals were made. At the end of day six, when all other creatures had been made, God made mankind as a similar but separate and unique creation. That's taxonomy by creation date, which is how we've organized this film, by the days of creation. The strength of this system is one, that's the way creation actually happened. And two, we naturally and normally think of creatures by their habitat, air for the flying things, water for the swimming things, and land for the land creatures. Plus, we naturally and normally think of mankind as separate and elevated, different than all other creatures. Jesus Christ himself agrees with this observation. Listen to this. 
Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs on your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. That means that God values his sparrows so much that he keeps close track of and cares for each one of them. Yet, as much as he cares for his sparrows, he loves and values people still more. Mankind is the only creature made in the image of God. That's why you aren't classified as an animal. You may have some elements in common with animals. You may know some people that act like animals, but you aren't an animal. Of all the creatures, you belong to that special and unique kind called man, who carries the imago dei, the image of God. This hierarchy is reflected in the creation account itself. On the first three days of creation, God builds the sets, the backdrops, in preparation of introducing his main characters, who are brought out in the last three days of creation. On day one, he separates light from darkness. Day two, he separates the waters above, sky, from the waters below, seas. On day three, he separates the land from the seas and creates all the vegetation, plants. Those are the sets. Now that they're built, it's time to bring out the main actors. On day four, God creates the sun, moon, and stars. These move into the scenery he created back on day one, space, and they take over the role of separating night from day. Next, he creates swimming and flying creatures. These are the actors who will work in the water and air, which was created in day two. Finally, on day six, he creates land animals and people to populate the dry land and eat the vegetation, which he created back on day three. This is biblical classification, taxonomy, according to the days of creation. Plus, Linnaeus's basic classification system works quite nicely within this historic creation framework. And now we turn our attention to days three, five, and six, the days when all life forms were created.